Well, hello. Welcome. I apologize. I have um, tried to do share screen, uh, but for whatever reason, that is not working. And um, I have a training that I'm going to be at today, so we won't be having our live class. So I'm pre-recording this one. It's a it's a very early in the morning, and I'm trying to um, do this before I go to training so that I'm not thinking about it all day long. I'm going to miss you guys. And um, because this doesn't allow for our conversation, which is such a big part of what we've done this semester, and I appreciate all of you. I also apologize for the for the screen. It's just going to be a large image of me. I apologize for that. I wouldn't want to see that either. But uh, we um, we have technology, and it's amazing when I can get it to work. And uh, today, for whatever reason, I just couldn't couldn't get that share screen to work. Um, this is my third take so we're just going to uh <clears throat> to go with this but i wanted to uh to recap what an amazing semester it has been we are in our final chapter in our study of uh of the pastoral epistles or the, or the letters to preachers uh, we we studied all the first timothy we looked at titus and now we are finishing up second timothy today um next week is thanksgiving and then the, the following week, um, we can meet for class, but it's not going to be a, a normal class. It will just be a, a time kind of a, a reflection, um, probably be very short, just to say, um, what are your takeaways? So that's what we'll be doing. If you are watching this and um, you are part of the class, especially if you're taking it for credit, then please send me an email and let me know that you have watched it. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, I'll pray and then we'll dive in. God, I pray that this, uh, that the things that, that are mentioned tonight, they honor you. God, I pray that you will be glorified. I thank you for your word. I thank you for these letters to Timothy and to Titus and, and what an honor it has been to be, um, to be able to look at those and examine them and examine them against their own lives. And I just thank you and I praise you. God, um, as I speak today, I pray that you will be glorified and honored. Um, I pray that this will spark discussion um, while we can't do it in a traditional way that we have in this class, but I, I pray that it um, starts a discussion within our own heart that we look upon who you are and who you call us to be and what you have in store for us, and that we take the responsibilities of being your um, your followers and your leaders. Seriously, it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Grab a drink real here, right here before I get started. Okay, so 2 Timothy chapter 4 contains the last things that Paul writes. This is the, the final chapter. And I don't know what maybe what you would write if you were going to if you knew that your time was ending and and you were going to write one one final message to someone. This is Paul's final message to Timothy and, and most likely the, the the church. But we know for certain that his time is coming near an end. And so it contains the last thing that Paul writes that he's going to tell Timothy because Paul's about to be executed. He solemnly charges Timothy to be faithful and urgent in his ministry. And he warns him that at a time, that a time is coming when most people will be intent on their own way, that they cannot bear to hear the truth. But Paul has completed a faithful ministry. And he can look forward to Christ's reward. Paul has been deserted by most of his former helpers, only Luke's with him. Um, Timothy has come to Paul quickly. He's, he tells, he's told by Paul, come quickly before winter in order to help Paul, to be at Paul's side during these last days on this earth. You see, a person's last words are significant. They are a window that tell us how to look into a person's heart. They... Maybe they're a measure that help us evaluate a person's life. And in this chapter, we have Paul's final words, his, his last words to Timothy. 
and to the church. And Paul gives Timothy three admonitions. In verses one through four, his admonition is preach the word. In five and eight, it's fulfill your ministry. And in nine through the end, it's be diligent and faithful. So preach the word, fulfill your ministry, be diligent and faithful. So I'm going to read the first uh, the, the first bit here and then discuss it. Second Timothy chapter four, beginning in verse one. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. And instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Let's just finish it up. Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demos, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Christians has gone to, uh, Christians has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left it with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially my parchments. Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him. Because he has strongly opposed our message. At my first offense, no one came to me, uh, to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against him. But the Lord stood by my side and he gave me the strength so that through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and all Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Pris Priscilla and Aquila in the house of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. People that greet you, so do Putin's Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. The Lord be with your spirit, and grace be with you all. Those are some beautiful words that Paul writes. What a message he leaves us. He leaves Timothy and, and us. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. The charge that, that Paul is about to give Timothy is very important. It's so important that Paul does it in the presence of God and Christ as his witness and a view of Christ's return and judgment. See, this was a serious moment, and Paul wanted Timothy to sense the importance of it. Preach the word. The word preach means to proclaim like a herald. See, in that day, 
a, a ruler had a special herald who would uh, who would make announcements to the people. He was uh, commissioned by the ruler to make the announcements in a loud, clear voice so that everyone could hear. And he tells Timothy, be prepared. As you proclaim this word, be prepared in season and out of season. The word that's translated here, be prepared, means to be standing by, be at the ready. There's this sense of urgency here. Timothy should be diligent and alert and use every opportunity to preach the word. When it's favorable, when it's not favorable. When it's comfortable, when it's not comfortable. It's easy to make excuses when we should be making opportunities. Be prepared in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and correct. Uh, Careful instruction, correct, rebuke, encourage. Preaching should be marked by three elements, by conviction, by warning, and by appeal. That's another way of saying reprove, rebuke, and, and exhort or encourage. The speaker, the preacher should afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. If there is conviction but no remedy, we add to a, per to a person's burdens. If we encourage those that, we, that ought to be rebuked, then we assist them in sin. You see, biblical preaching must be balanced. And Paul gave the responsibility, preach the word. And then he goes on to give the reason. When he says a time is coming when people will not put up with sound teaching, they will not endure sound teaching. Many will turn away toward myths. They will gather teachers to tell them what they want to hear. A preacher could probably make it pretty big if you just say things that everybody wants to hear. But you're not going to be popular. If you proclaim the word of God with sound teaching. There are many who seek Christianity for selfish reasons. Trying to get what they want. And it's just a short step from itching ears to turning away from the truth. And once people have rejected the truth, they turn to fables or myths. And man-made tales will not convict the sin that is in our lives. Or cause us to want to repent. And the result would be a congregation of comfortable proclaiming Christians. Listening to comfortable religious talk. That contains no real biblical truth or doctrine. It would not be the word of God. Now if you notice in here. Um, there is an emphasis on scripture. He says, uh, he says preach the word. He says, with careful instruction. He says, uh, people won't put up with sound doctrine. He says that they will turn away from the truth. This emphasis on sound doctrine seems to run throughout all three of these letters of 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. The sound teaching of God is, is, is very beautiful and satisfying to those who love God and who hunger after righteousness. But the truth is also very uncomfortable to those who seek to live for their own pleasures. They will not put up with sound teaching. You see, the word of God is what's needed. So he told them to preach the word. And he tells them to fulfill his ministry. As for you, in contrast to those that aren't going to put up with sound teaching, as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Be sober-minded, keep your head in all situations. Be morally alert. You see, we must not lose our heads when we face opposition or, or hang our heads when we're discouraged. 
Sober-mindedness is absolutely necessary. Avoid, I, I, I like this, this is um, by a preacher I, I heard about, named Alistair. Um, and so, this is what he says. He says, avoid being fat-headed. That's being puffed up with pride. Uh, uh, avoid being bobble-headed. That's bouncing around from doctrine to doctrine. Avoid being empty-headed, getting involved in ignorant controversies. Avoid being sick-headed. That's having a mind filled with immorality. And avoid being hot-headed, responding to critics with anger instead of gentleness. That's not what we're called to be. Instead, instead, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we should be level-headed, sober-minded, keep our head in all situations. Endure hardship, he tells Timothy. Endure hardship. Don't be shaken by opposition from the false teachers. They're going to seek to persecute you. They're going to try to destroy you. But you, you endure. Avoid being bitter in hardship. Don't quit because of hardship. Do not respond in malice because of hardship. You see, Timothy was challenged earlier to share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ. No one will be able to say triumphantly uh, the way that Paul did, I fought the good fight. I finished a race if they do not learn to endure hardship. You see, those who desire to obey Christ are going to face hardship, going to face trials. And let hardships that come from following Jesus lead you into prayer and not into despair. I'm going to say that again. Let the hardships that come from following Jesus lead you into prayer and not into despair. And then he tells Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. An evangelist is, is one who, who proclaims the gospel. While Timothy was, was to teach the word to those who belong to Christ, he was also to teach and reach the unbelieving world with the good news. Timothy is to remain a true evangelist, preaching the true gospel of God. You see, not, not every minister has the same gifts, but every minister can share the same burden and proclaim the same saving message. I believe I said this a few weeks ago. Others may preach the gospel better, but no one will ever preach a better gospel. An evangelist is also never alone because the, the Holy Spirit is, is the great evangelist who, who opens the eyes for people to see. And then he tells Timothy, fulfill your ministry. Fulfill whatever God calls you to do. Timothy's ministry is not going to be exactly like Paul's, but it's an important ministry. You see, no ministry that is God honoring is insignificant or unimportant. We must not measure the fulfillment of a ministry only by the basics of, of uh, basis of statistics or, or on what people can see. You see, faithfulness is important to God. And God looks upon the heart. There was this missionary in the 18th century. His name was uh, Nicholas Zeisendorf. And he said, preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. Now, what he's saying there is that what you do is insignificant. He's saying that that's what's significant. You preach the gospel. You die. And if you're forgotten, it doesn't matter. Because the word of God lives on. Because you preached the gospel. In 2 Timothy um, 4, 6 through 8, Paul issues this charge in light of impending uh, martyrdom. Let me read it one more time to us, 4, 6 through 8. 
For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and a time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Paul issues his charge in the light of his impending martyrdom. He was about to move off the scene and, and Timothy's going to have to take his place. And we find Paul in those few verses looking in three different directions. He, he looked at the present situation. He looked around. He looked at the past. And then he looked ahead to the future. Verse 6 is where Paul looks around kind of at his current situation, at the present. He knows the end is near. And the image Paul uses is drawn from Old Testament sacrificial system. And, and during that, that ritual, which you can read about if you want, it's uh, Exodus 29, 40, 40 and 41, right around there. Um, Leviticus 23, 13, Numbers 15, and, uh, and a little bit in Numbers 28 as well. You see, during, during the ritual of sacrificing a lamb, wine was to be poured out at the base of the altar. And that's kind of what he's referencing here. The, the word, the two words that he uses, offered and departure, kind of tell us a little bit about his faith and about his confidence. Offered, offered refers to being poured out on the altar like a drink offering. It's like saying, okay, Caesar's going to kill me. Or Nero's going to kill me. I'm going to be, I'm going to give my life as a sacrifice to Jesus. Giving it to Jesus. I'm a, I'm a living sacrifice. I've been I've been serving him, knowing that eventually I'm going to die in him all of my life. I've been doing that since the day I came to know Christ, since the day he saved me, he rescued me. And now I'm about to complete that sacrifice by laying down my life. For his cause. And departure. Departure is a word that has a lot of different meanings. And I thought these were really cool as so I was kind of digging into these a little bit and thinking about this imagery. It can mean to uh, to hoist an anchor and to set sail. It's like Paul looks on death as a release from this world, as an, as an opportunity to set sail into eternity. Paul's lifting the anchor. He's tossing aside the ropes and he's joyfully sailing on to his reward. The word can also carry with it this, this meaning of taking down a tent, like a soldier loosing the stakes of a tent. And for, for the believer, death is taking down the tent in order to receive permanent housing, a permanent reward. <clears throat> the word can also mean the loosing of a soldier, the release of a soldier. Paul was facing release, not execution. He wasn't being killed. He was being set free. Set free to his eternal reward. And the word can also refer to unyoking an ox. Paul served Jesus for so many years. And now his master would unyoke him and promote him to even higher service. That's beautiful. Paul expresses no ill will, no regrets. I like what Charles Spurgeon said whenever he was discussing his own, his own death as he was going to soon be departing this world. He said, to come to thee is to come home from exile. To come to a land out of the raging storm. To come to rest after a long labor, to come to the goal of my desires and the summit of my wishes. <clears throat> Spurgeon understood it. Paul understood it. Now, while the Bible does not record the death of Paul, history tradition tells us that he was beheaded in 67 AD by the emperor Nero. 
So Paul looked around at his circumstances. Verse 6. And in verse 7, <clears throat> Paul looks back. He looks back at the past. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Like a determined boxer, he had fought a good fight. Like a runner, he had finished his lifelong race. Paul was a warrior. He probably wasn't really all that impressive physically. But he was a spiritual warrior. He stood before Felix, Agrippa, and the officials of Rome with courage. He endured the riots in Ephesus. He, he faced opposition in Corinth. Listen to Paul's own words that he writes the church in Corinth. As we get to 2 Corinthians, uh, I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This is verses 23 through 28. It tells us a little bit about this hardship that Paul endured. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country. In danger at sea and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have gone often without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked and besides everything else, I face the daily pressures of my concern for all the churches. Paul understands hardship. He's He's looking around at the current situation saying, yes, I'm being poured out like a drink offering, but I fought hard. I have fought hard. I have endured. I have finished the race. Can you envision the war-torn apostle writing this letter from a hole in the ground in Rome? <laughs> Can you imagine being Timothy and receiving this letter and being told to endure hardship from someone who has endured such hardship in his lifetime? Paul wasn't always popular. Paul wasn't comfortable, but he always remained faithful. And that's what mattered. We all have a race to run. You and I, we have a race. So keep on running. Remain faithful. Endure. Get uh, Guard the gospel. Every Christian in general, and, and especially leaders, This is for us. We need to take special heed. We also have a fight to endure, a race to run, and a treasure to guard. Paul looked around, Paul looked at the past, and Paul looked to the future in verse 8. There is reserved for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award. You see, an, an athlete who, who won an event like a race was, was rewarded with the laurel um, wreath to wear as a crown. But Paul would not be receiving a crown that fades. His crown will be a crown of righteousness. Mm. And it will never fade. Paul says that this crown will be given to him by Jesus, the righteous judge. Jesus, the righteous judge. While Nero would declare Paul guilty and condemn him, Christ would declare him righteous and receive him. The crown will be given not only to Paul, but to all those who loved his appearing. The crown of righteousness is God's reward for a faithful and righteous life. This vision kept Paul running. It will keep Timothy running the race, and it should cause us to continue running in faithfulness also. Do you see Jesus? 
There he is. You're getting closer. Keep running. Keep fighting. Keep guarding the gospel. Soon, we're going to see him. We will see his, his nail-scarred hands. We will hear his voice as he says, well done. And on that day, you and I will not regret fighting and running and enduring hardship. For we will receive the victor's crown of righteousness. Paul understood that. Now, the rest of these uh, of these verses are about being diligent and, and faithful. And he uses examples of, of people. He tells Timothy, um, do your best to come to me quickly. You see, we see the importance of relationships. What's on the apostle's mind? Well, it's, it's Jesus, of course. And it's people. And it's and it's touching as you read this letter to see that in his closing days, in his last few days on this earth, Paul wants his dear son, Timothy, at his side. Paul mentions a number of individuals. that Some are friends and some are foes. Some are faithful. Some were unfaithful. Some started out well, but they departed. And others... Had a rocky start, but they're finishing well. And Paul wants Timothy to come because Demas deserted him. That word deserted is a very strong verb, and it means to utterly abandon and to leave someone helpless in a dire situation. He says that Christian has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark, bring him with you, for he's very useful to me. And Mark's story, wow, what a story that is. It's encouraging. Mark had some, some special privileges. He hung around a lot with the apostles and with Jesus. And so he was very familiar with the life of Jesus. But when Paul goes on his, uh, on his first missionary journey, he takes uh, Mark, goes along with him. But for whatever reason, Mark leaves. Uh, you can read about that in Acts chapter 13. And, and so later, Barnabas wanted to take Mark along with them on another trip with him and Paul. But Paul said, no, no way. Paul's rejecting this. Like, no, he's not coming. He deserted us last time. He viewed Mark as a deserter. So Barnabas and Mark go one way. Paul and Silas go the other way. But now we read Mark's restored. He's forgiven. He, he's, he's forgiven by Christ, for sure, but he's also forgiven by Paul. In fact, he's present with Paul during his first imprisonment. Paul calls him a, a co-worker, and here Paul is mentioning him in a, in a positive way. As a helpful companion. That story should give encourage to you. If you've ever felt as though you've fallen, fallen away. Despite rejection, possible shame, hurt, failure, Mark is restored. And he's considered a faithful and helpful companion and co-laborer. Paul mentions a lot of people in here. And we could probably spend a lot of time talking about each of them. And, and that's an important study. I'd encourage you to, to look to look up these uh, these men that he mentions, these men. And then, uh, of course, Priscilla, she'd be a lady. Look them up and and spend some time kind of seeing who they are. Some we know more about and some we, we know very little or nothing about. But Paul deemed them all worth mentioning in his final letter. Some perhaps as warnings to us. Some as encouragement to us. Some remain faithful. Some unfaithful. Some seemed like they were going to be faithful and they fell away when things got hard. 
Paul also mentions, um, you know, kind of this, this idea of being delivered. He delivered me. Um, God was always with me. He delivered me. Let me find this right here. From the mouth of the lion. Um, verse 16. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against him. But the Lord, I love that. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and all Gentiles might hear it. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. He knows God is with him always. <clears throat> he stayed faithful. Paul's going to meet his end on this earth. But Timothy and other devoted believers carried on the work. And you and I, you and I, we have work to do also. So be faithful. I love how he ends it. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace and peace be with you all. The Lord be with your spirit. That's that's singular. He's he's talking to Timothy. Because Timothy's going to need some grace. His mentor's going to be leaving. Not just not just leaving a different city like he did whenever he left Timothy in Ephesus, but he's he's leaving this earth. There aren't going to be any more letters to Timothy. Timothy's got to make it to him in order to see him one more time. And Timothy's going to need some extra grace for the trials that he's going to face. And then he says, and grace be with you or you all. Or as we say here in Oklahoma, grace be with y'all. That you is plural. And he's talking to all those that would be reading this. And so, hey, we've had, I think, some some really good times of discussion over, over the course of these 13, 14 weeks or however long we've been doing this. And while I wish we were able to meet tonight to have this, uh, to have a discussion I know that God is working. God is working. And so I leave you the words which Paul left as he ends this letter. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace and peace be with you all. Have a blessed day.